Hi everybody, welcome back to Educating Adventures. Today we are going to be exploring an ecosystem that holds a very special place in my heart because I happen to live in the middle of one. We are going to be exploring desert ecosystems, some of the most extreme environments all around the world. So let's go ahead and get started. Like all ecosystems, the desert ecosystem is defined by the living or the biotic and the non-living or abiotic things that are found in that area and how all of those things interact with one another. So before we get started talking too much about the desert, I want to give you guys a chance to think about some of the things that you might already know about the desert. Think of some of the living and the non-living things that come to mind right away when you picture the desert. This is going to be a good time for you to pause the video to give yourself a chance to discuss as a class what type of stuff you might find in the desert. Are you ready? So when I think of the desert, there is one big thing that comes to mind right away, and that is that there is not a lot of water. We do not get a lot of rain in the desert. Some deserts in the world actually go years without seeing any rain at all. I bet a lot of you guys thought when we would think of a desert that you would think of somewhere really, really hot. And while there are a lot of hot deserts, like where I live in the Sonoran Desert, I live in Arizona, that is a really hot desert ecosystem, but some desert ecosystems are actually really cold. Some people actually consider the tundra a frozen desert because they also don't get a lot of rain up in the tundra. So that is the biggest thing that I think of in the desert, but we're going to be focusing mostly today on a hot desert. So let's go ahead and explore first some of the abiotic things that we would find in a hot desert. The most obvious one is the temperature, right? It is super, super hot in Arizona, especially in the summer. It can be 120 degrees outside. That temperature makes it really hard for plants and animals to survive. It makes all the water that might be here evaporate or dry up really, really quickly. Another thing we get a lot of in the desert here in Arizona is sun exposure. There are not a lot of clouds in the sky here, so that sun shines down and that can make plants overheat or animals overheat and it can really dry things out super easily. Another thing about the desert is the soil is not always the best for plants to grow in. A lot of the times the soil in the desert does not have a lot of nutrients. And nutrients are another one of those abiotic things that we would find in an environment. All the nutrients that's in the soil, that's what gives plants all the stuff they need to grow, just like the nutrients we get from our food is what gives us energy to survive. So lots of things about the desert, these abiotic factors that make it really challenging for the biotic factors to survive here. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about some of the biotic factors we would find in the desert. The first biotic factor that we're going to talk about are plants. And plants, when we picture the desert, we might not picture any plants at all. We might picture an empty landscape with sand, but there are lots of plants that live in the desert and they are all very specialized to live here. In the Sonoran Desert, where I live, there is a very cool plant called a creosote bush. And creosote bushes are very well designed for the hot Sonoran Desert. One thing that they have that helps them is teeny tiny little leaves. Plants are vulnerable to losing water through a process called transpiration. So when all that water is stored up in a plant's leaves, they can escape through the leaf as water vapor up into the atmosphere. So by having small leaves, there's less room for that water to escape from the plant. Creosote bush leaves are also covered in a waxy coating, and that waxy coating helps to trap water inside of the leaves. So that way, even if the water did want to escape, it's kind of stuck beneath that waxy coating layer. 
There's another great plant here called a brittle bush. And brittle bush leaves are very special because they have a coating of very little white hairs. And because those white hairs are light in color, they help when the sun shines down, a lot of that light actually bounces right off of the leaf. If they had dark leaves, some of that sunlight would be absorbed. So having a light colored leaf helps some of that sunlight reflect off of the leaf and helps keep the plant cool and prevent some of that transpiration from happening. So we're kind of seeing a common trend that leaves are a really hard thing for plants in the desert to have. That's where a lot of the water escapes from. So there's actually a plant called a Paula Verde tree that sometimes in the summer when it's really hot and there's really not a lot of rain, they actually can lose their leaves. And their bark is what photosynthesizes. So normally plants depend on their leaves to turn all that sunlight into energy for the plant, but Paula Verdes are special because they can drop all of their leaves and their branches and their trunk will actually take over that process and create enough energy for the tree to survive. And that way there are no leaves at all for water to escape from. There's really very little transpiration when there's not a lot of leaves on a tree. And the first plant that I actually think of when I think of the desert is a cactus, especially where I live in the Sonoran Desert. We have a beautiful cactus here called a saguaro cactus. And you guys might be familiar with these ones. They're really tall and they have all those funny looking arms. And those guys are very, very well designed for the desert. Their roots are really shallow underneath the ground. They're maybe only an inch or two down. So when it does rain, the saguaros can suck up as much of that water as possible before it evaporates. And when they suck up that water into their big, tall columns, those columns can actually expand. And cacti are really good at storing water for the times of the year when there is not a lot of rain which is really important for a plant that lives in the desert, which is super, super dry. So all of these plants that we just mentioned, we said have lots of really cool things about them that help them to survive in the desert. But there are actually lots of animals that are very specialized as well. And one of those animals that comes to mind right away is a tortoise. And walnut here is a sulcata tortoise. And sulcata tortoises are found over in the deserts of Africa. And walnut, like all tortoises, is an herbivore, which means that he likes to eat plants. And all of the grasses and the leaves that walnut is eating over in the desert are filled with water and moisture. So this plant diet that he has makes him very well adapted for dry ecosystems. But tortoises aren't the only animal that we find in the desert. We also find animals like camels. And one very special thing that camels have to help them survive without a lot of water is those big humps on their back. And sometimes you might have heard that camels humps are filled with water. They're actually filled with fat and camels are able to pull from those fat stores to get moisture and energy that they need to survive when there's not a lot of food or water around for them. There's another animal that's very different than a camel that uses a very similar strategy and that animal is a Gila monster. And this lizard, it doesn't have humps on its back like a camel, but instead it stores fat in its tail. So you guys might notice that this lizard has a really chunky tail and that tail is filled with lots of different types of energy that that lizard can pull from during the really dry season. Animals in the desert also spend a lot of time avoiding the sun. So it wouldn't make a lot of sense for animals to be out during the middle of the day when it's super hot. So animals like coyotes and snakes, they will all come out at nighttime to go hunting and do all of the things that they need to do to survive. We call those animals nocturnal when they are awake at nighttime. Animals in the desert also use kind of the same strategy as some of those plants. 
So if we think of an Arabian oryx, who is white in color, when that hot sun shines down on them, a lot of that light bounces right off of that light colored fur and helps to keep them cool. That again, works a lot better than if they had dark fur. That would be absorbing a lot of that light. And possibly the coolest and cutest thing that animals have to help them survive in the desert is really big ears. So if we think of an animal like a fennec fox, which lives over in the hot deserts of Africa, they have giant ears compared to their tiny little bodies. And having big ears helps because as all that blood is flowing through their body, that warm blood, when it gets up into their ears, that heat can escape and send cooler blood back to the rest of their body. There are lots of other animals that do this too. Even African elephants will use their ears to help them cool down. And when animals use their ears to help them stay cool, we like to call it ear conditioning. Plants and animals in the desert certainly do not live an easy life. There are lots of things that they have had to learn how to overcome and cool things that they have had to develop over time. And while we usually might picture the desert as an empty landscape, now we know that the desert is full of life. Thank you guys so much for joining me today on this educating adventure and I hope we see you guys next time.